and welcome to today's webinar on electrical safety testing circuit theory. Um, I'm your presenter, Syed Abidi, also the applications engineer here at Associated Research. And uh, joining us today are, as usual, Jim Kennessy, who's our organizer, uh, also the communications leader at AR. And we have a new face today on our panel, Vishan Patel. He is our um, second applications engineer, and uh, he's uh, pretty new to the company and uh, catching up on things very fast. So he'll be helping us today with answering any questions on the chat line. So the topic for today's uh, present, uh, webinar is electrical safety testing circuit theory. Today is April 15th. And we are here live from Lake Forest, Illinois, and it's 52 degrees Fahrenheit out there. Just a few quick notes on our webinar to help you guys uh, with any, if you face any issues with the webinar. We have a Q&A utility to ask any questions concerning the material being presented. Any questions related to the running of the meeting, uh, such as audio or video issues, can be addressed to our host, Jim Kennessy through our chat line. Um, we will also include some poll questions in our webinar as usual and when these pop up please take a few uh, uh, minutes or, or a minute almost to answer uh, the poll questions. They'll help us uh, you know, um, tailor our webinar and improve upon them. And um, as usual this webinar is also being recorded and uh, will be available to view uh, usually within a day or two. So once again, if you need a copy of this presentation of this webinar, feel free to contact Jim Kennessy on our chat line or email him at jimk at asresearch.com. Okay, so before we jump into our material for today's webinar, just a quick recap on what was covered during the last webinar, which was uh, electrical Safety Testing 102. Uh, I did present this one as well and um, we ended up covering, um, talking about some of the electrical safety tests types and what they do. Um, we looked into some of the test requirements, where, why and where are these tests required. Then we gave you some tips on finding the right tester for your application and also some very important tips on what not to do when, you know, during testing. Some safety tips and other good information. So that's what we covered last time and our today's learning objectives are we're going to again start with uh, reviewing some of the electrical safety tests before we talk and also we're going to talk about the circuits for these electrical safety tests. How, how, how is the circuit design for each test type and what does it exactly do and what's being tested. And um, we're also going to look into some of our um, patent features such as arc detection and smart GFI circuits, some very important features that, that are patent to associated research and uh, um, help a great deal with our testing. Before we jump into our uh, main material, once again, I'd like to quickly go, uh, you know, just uh, go over the types of tests that we have covered in the past and we will be covering today again, starting with the ground continuity test, the ground bond test, the dielectric withstand test, also known as the HIPOT, insulation resistance, and the touch current test or the line leakage test. And we will get, get into this uh, the test types shortly. But before we do, we have a quick poll question for you because we want to know which safety test do you perform. So if you could take a brief moment and uh, we're going to put the webinar on a pause and you, are, you should be able to um, you know, provide your answers.
Okay, Syed. Uh, we have the uh, uh, majority of the people voted, and uh, we have 92% perform high pot, 56% uh, uh, perform ground bond, 58% uh, perform ground continuity, 59 insulation resistance, and then 56 would be would be line linkage. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim, for sharing the results. So it looks like uh, most of uh, the most uh, uh, commonly performed tests, as we know, is the high pot, and that's what the polls show. But um, most, uh, a lot of you guys are performing ground continuity, ground bond, and insulation resistance, and uh, the line leakage tests. So that's that's always good to know that you guys are aware, kind of aware, of what these tests are, and uh, the intention is to you know educate you even more on on these test types. Okay. So the first test type that we're going to quickly cover is the ground continuity test. Well, as the name implies, this test verifies if a connection exists between the exposed conduct conductive parts and the ground of the power cord on a product under test. Now, since this test is verifying the continuity uh, or the, even the existence of a ground, grounding circuit of your product, it has to be performed on class 1 products because it says ground continuity. If it was just a continuity test, you could perform it on any two parts of the circuit, but since this one is a ground continuity test, you have to have a class 1 product with a grounding circuit to be able to perform this test. It's a, it's a routine production line test and a, a very low voltage AC or DC signal is applied from the chassis of the product to the ground pin. It's not it's uh, no different than taking a you know a digital multimeter with two probes and touching the two probes at two different parts of the circuit and uh, checking for continuity and seeing if the circuit is continuous or not. It's usually performed at a current under one amp, so it's a very uh, you know small signal to check if the ground is continuous. So again, a very basic test. However, the next test that we're going to talk about is a more stringent test. Also has to do with the ground circuit of your device, but <clears throat> it's uh, the the ground bond test runs us, uh, you know, slightly differently than the ground continuity test. Again, it is also performed on class one products that have a grounding circuit, and the definition of the ground bond test is that this test verifies the integrity of the ground connection between exposed metal and ground wire of the power cord. So the difference between ground continuity and ground bond being that the ground continuity is just verifying if a continuous ground circuit exists in your product, whereas a ground bond test is actually verifying the integrity of the ground circuit, how good it is and uh, you know how much fault current will it be able to handle if if a fault occurs so the way this test the ground bond test is run is a high current is injected into the ground pin of the product's uh, power cord which flows to the chassis of the product and the uh, and the return circuit is connected onto the chassis and it eventually determines if the ground safety ground circuit is capable of handling excessive current flow in case a fault occurs and the product's insulation fails. Here's a, here's a basic circuit showing um, on the left side a ground bond tester, on the right side your product under test, and um, um, for uh, most of associated research uh, high pot, I mean uh, ground bond testers use uh, what we call a four wire method to <clears throat> basically eliminate the inherent uh, test lead resistance from the test results so it kind of offsets the test lead resistance and um, we're gonna quickly show you a video of the ground how an actual ground bond test is uh, performed before we talk more about the ground bond test And before I um, play this video, just a quick uh, uh, 
explanation on what's going on here is that we've set up um, a ground bond test that would fail and a ground bond test that would pass. We've also set up a ground continuity test uh, for a pass and fail condition. The device being tested here is one of our load boxes called the TVB2. It's a verification box and uh, we will talk about it more in, uh, in more detail in one of our upcoming webinars on verification, but think of this box as just simple, uh, you know, resistive loads. Um, the high current will be injected on one end and the return will be measured on the other end. The red wire is where the high current is being injected and the black wire going back to the instrument is uh, the return circuit for this test and as you can see it's a four wire measurement to offset the lead resistance. So that was a ground continuity pass and a ground continuity fail is the next test and you can see the test failed for a high limit. Next test is a ground bond pass condition. The result is in uh, milliohms and then the last test we're going to show is the ground bond fail which shows that the test, uh, you know, the, the resistance of the ground circuit exceeded uh, to what was set as the threshold during the test. Okay, so back to our ground bond circuit. Well, here's a, the same circuit that we just saw in our previous slide uh, showing a pass condition. What's going on here is that high current, the dotted, uh, uh, the shaded green and black line is showing the high current being injected or pumped into the ground pin of a class one product. That and the return circuit uh, the four wire measurement is being measured at the chassis of the product verifying that this ground circuit is uh, low enough impedance and is is okay in case a fault occurs and it should be it's capable of uh, you know dealing with any fault currents as a result of a fault on your product this slide is showing you a picture of a ground bond fail um, test. Basically the t we're showing, what we're showing is again similarly the t uh, high current is being injected into the ground pin. However, this time the ground circuit failed, meaning that the resistance of the ground circuit came out to be too high, which means that it, it, it may not be able to uh, deal with any fault currents if a fault was to occur on your product. So as you can see, this is a much more stringent test uh, for your grounding circuit, unlike the ground continuity. And um, usually when the ground bond test is performed, the ground continuity test is not necessary because the ground bond test is, you know, is testing the integrity of a ground product, of a, of a grounding circuit that is, that has to be continuous. If this so the ground circuit is not continuous, the ground bond test will fail because it will see infinite resistance. Few other considerations for um, ground bond test. Um, this is uh, commonly considered a type test and we've discussed uh, type test, production line test in one of our previous webinars. And um, the results of this test are displayed in ohms or milliohms. Um, the, the one important thing to know about the ground bond test is that uh, the ground conductor of a product must have a low enough impedance to handle any fault currents. So in the picture at the bottom of the slide, we're sh basically showing you a one of our high uh, high current testers, ground bond testers, uh, uh, called the high amp series. And as you can see, the two red wires are uh, connected to the ground pin of this class one type product which in this case is a, is a household fan and uh, so the red wires are injecting the high current into the ground pin and the return is connected, the black wires are connected onto the chassis of the product making the measurement the four, and also completing the four wire measurement and you know uh, negating any uh, lead resistance. 
few other consider uh, considerations for ground bond tests and again you know um, the test parameters for a ground bond test vary from standard to standard. Um, all manufacturers must consult the safety standard that they're trying to comply with uh, before setting the test parameters. For example, if you are an IT equipment uh, company, um, most likely you will be following uh, the standard called UL60950, which calls out for the test current for your ground bond test to be twice the fuse rating of your product or twice the current rating of the circuit under test. So for example, if your device is rated at 5 amps, then your ground bond tests will most likely be performed at 10 amps. The test voltage is not to exceed 12 volts and the duration of the test um, you know, should not exceed 120 seconds. Since this is a very high current test, you don't want it to be applied for too long on your um, grounding circuit. The test current can be AC or DC based on the product and the safety standard. Again, uh, some safety standards do call out for, uh, or certain products are required to perform, you know, that run off of DC potential uh, or DC power are required to, <coughs> you know, run a DC ground bond test, for example, solar panels. So that was our ground bond test, and uh, the next test that we're going to talk about is the dielectric withstand test, also commonly known as the HIPAT test. And this test is used to determine whether the insulation of a product is able to withstand an over-voltage condition for a period of time without breaking down. So what that really means is a high potential is applied between the mains conduct the current carrying conductors, which is your for a three-pronged product, for example, your line and neutral, short it together, and the high voltage is applied between your current carrying conductor and your non-current carrying conductor. Hence, uh, stressing the insulation of your product to to a to a limit, and checking whether the insulation will be able to withstand this high this uh, potential being uh, applied across it. And if it breaks down, that means insulation quality is bad and the manufacturer needs to um, go back and look into improving the quality of the insulation of their product. So basically, the dielectric withstand test is a deliberate application of high voltage potential between the main input, mains input and any exposed dead metal. The resulting leakage current due to the application of the high voltage is measured to determine whether a product's insulation is able to withstand the high voltage without breaking down. And uh, basically, this test verifies that the insulation of your product is capable of protecting the user from any leakage current currents as a result of an electrical fault within the product. Now, we're going to talk more and go in a lot more detail on the HIPOT test uh, in one of some of our upcoming webinars. We're basically going to touch upon each of these electrical safety tests. We have uh, dedicated webinars for these test types, so we're going to go into a lot more detail. But here, we're just trying to get a, get a feel of what this test does and what is actually being tested and what kind of circuit is used to test uh, run these tests. So, the dielectric withstand test or the HIPAA test can be a type test or a routine test. Again, this goes back to the standard that you're trying to comply with. Your standard may call out for uh, a, you know, the HIPAA test being a type test or a routine test and, may, and you know, it will also provide you with <coughs> test parameters for your test. The dielectric withstand test is also used to detect possible defects in the design of a product and worksmanship defects, such as inadequate creepage and clearance distance between your current carrying conductors on, on, your, on your circuit boards. Also on this uh, page, you can see a basic diagram or a circuit for a HIPOT test. Um, in the picture you'll see on the left side is our dielectric uh, uh, analyzer 
which in this case is a is an all-in-one compliance analyzer, the Omnia series, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. So what's going on in this picture is that the high voltage is uh, coming out and being connected to the mains input by shorting line in neutral and the return connection being uh, uh, connected to the back to the chassis of the product. So before we go more into the more in depth uh, with the circuit theory about dielectric withstand test, just a quick video once again to show how a dielectric withstand test can be performed. So what's going on here is that we have an AC withstand test uh, set up at 1.24 kV with a high limit of 10 milliamps and again we're using the TVB2 load box this time we're doing just doing a pass condition uh, it's a 2 mega ohm load uh, and the potential is being applied between uh, the two ends of the load upon pushing the test button the potential is applied and the resulting leakage current comes out to be 6.2 um, milliamps which is basically telling us that the product insulation is leaking that much current. Back to our presentation. So basically in the video that we just saw what happened was well in this case uh, you know in our uh, what we saw in our video was a, a plain and simple resistive load. However for most products you know the products are somewhat capacitive, somewhat resistive. So the test may not be um, as simple for for other product types. However, the basic concept behind the dielectric withstand test is that if you've seen this picture, you can see the high voltage being applied again between the mains conductors and the non-current carrying conductors. And the return connection on the chassis of the product measuring the amount of leakage current that the insulation is allowing to flow on the chassis of the product. Now, what, what, what's really going on here? If you think about it, a high pot test or a dielectric withstand test uh, when being performed on a product is basically you can look at the product as a capacitor and that's why I have these uh, uh, symbols for, you know, circuit symbols for capacitor because really what is a capacitor? A capacitor is um, two conductors separated by an insulator. Well, in our case, in a dielectric withstand test, what's going on is the two conductors are your current carrying conductors and non-current carrying conductors, which are separated by the dielectric, which is in our case the insulation of our product or your product. And the insulation is being stressed to a limit. And the assumption here is that if the insulation can withstand this much amount of voltage, uh, for a given period of time, it should be able to withstand the, its, its nominal voltage that it's rated to work, work, work at. So for example, if your product is rated at 120 volts and if you perform a high pot test at 1240 volts, um, it's giving you a pretty good indication that your product's insulation should be good in its uh, normal, uh, during its normal life cycle. So this is uh, showing you a pass condition. Next, we're going to show you a fail condition for a high pot test. So what's going on here is that the insulation has been breached. It could be a breakdown or excessive leakage current flowing onto the chassis of the product. And the test, uh, the result of the test is a fail because usually we set um, high and low limits for our leakage current. And if any of those limits are um, exceeded, um, their test will result in a fail. So a few more considerations for a high pot test. Again, there's a simple picture showing uh, um, how the connections can be made for, a, for you know, testing a simple product such as a household fan. Um, what, what's important to know here is that leakage current is present in every product to some degree. In some products it may be so low that are so such a small leakage value that we may not be able to measure it. However, there is leakage current up to some degree on, on every electronic product. The, this leakage current becomes a problem when it reaches 
excessive levels due to dielectric breakdown. And that's what the high, high pot test is doing. It's, it's, it's uh, testing for breakdowns. The result of a high pot test, depending on AC or DC potential being applied, could be in milliamps or microamps, again, depending on the test type. And um, the high pot test is performed both on class 1 and class 2 products because really it uh, you know, does not matter if uh, the product is class 1 with a ground pin or a class 2 without a ground pin. The high pot, uh, the class 2 products have a dual layer of insulation so um, you know, it's equally important to perform a high pot test on class 2 products as it is on class 1 products. And the test can be performed in both an AC and a DC potential. Again, this is determined by the safety standard and, that you're trying to comply with and the type of product that you're trying to test. Test voltage and trip settings must be specified by the manufacturer in accordance with the safety standard. So again, I'm gonna, I know I've stressed uh, upon safety standards in the previous webinar and I'm going to keep stressing upon the safety, uh, you know, consulting the safety standard because that's really what you're trying to comply with and it should give you enough guidance to be able to perform the test and you know set all your failure limits accordingly. Um, as a rule of thumb, most of the test standards specify the test voltage uh, you know for the high high pot test to be calculated using the following formula which is twice the product's rated voltage plus a thousand volts. So for example if you're in the US most likely your product is rated to run at 120 volts. Well, if you do the math, the high pot test voltage comes out to be 1240. So that's, that's the potential that you will be setting on your uh, high pot test. So before, before we move any further, um, just a quick uh, reminder that um, feel free to use our chat line um, for any questions uh, that, you, that you may come up with and uh, we will leave some time at the end of the webinar to uh, answer any of the unanswered questions that you may have. Now after going over ground, ground bond and test and the dielectric withstand test, the big difference between the two tests is that the ground bond test is a high current test meaning that a, it's, it uses a high current and a very low voltage. However, the dielectric withstand test is a test that uses a very high voltage and lower current levels. So that here lies the big difference, but both the tests are very, very important, equally important, and um, again, must be performed um, with all the safety precautions which we have t already discussed in our previous webinars and also a reminder that all our webinars have been archived on our website so if you did miss out on any of the webinars feel free to uh, go on our website and email us and we can direct you to to the link to those webinars and you can you should be able to view them so having talked about the uh, dielectric withstand test, the next test that ma makes the most sense to discuss right after the high pot test is the insulation resistance test. Well, this test is very similar to a DC high pot test. Okay, now the insulation resistance test also stresses the same insulation on a product as the DC withstand test, however, it provides a, a quantifiable value of the product's insulation, meaning that um, unlike the high pot test, which provides a value of uh, the leakage current that the insulation is uh, allowing to flow on the chassis of your product, the insulation resistance test gives you an actual resistance value of the insulation. Could be in mega ohms, giga ohms, the higher the better. Um, the the other uh, thing important to know about the insulation resistance test is that the potential used in this test is slightly lower than what you usually use for your DC withstand test. Um, 
However, there, ha there are now standards that do require insulation resistance tests to be performed at higher voltages as well. However, um, the most, most of the standards commonly specify the test voltages for an insulation resistance test to be at 500 or 1000 volts. Um, it is, the insulation resistance test is one of the most uh, least commonly specified electrical safety tests due to, the, due to the reason that it is so similar to a DC withstand test that if, if, you are, if your standard is already asking you to perform a DC withstand test, there's a chance that the insulation resistance test may not be a requirement. But again, you know, the standard is, should be your guideline to determine what needs to be performed and what not. So the result of an insulation resistance test measurement is, is, is in uh, uh, ohms, which is a resistance value and which is exactly what this test is measuring. And the higher the insulation, um, you know, that indicates the insulation quality is good. A few other things are important points to note about the insulation resistance test. Um, again, you know, like other parameters, uh, like other safety tests, the test parameters vary based on the standard. For example, uh, the standard for safety of machinery, EN60204-1, specifies a test voltage of 500 volts DC test between the power circuit conductors and the protective bonding circuit the resistance shall not be less than one mega ohm. So here, this basically the standard is telling you or uh, providing the, uh, you know, uh, the companies or manufacturers with all the information you need to basically set up the test parameters for your insulation resistance test. And in the bottom, we can see that the insulation resistance test is performed very similarly to uh, a high pot test in that the high potential, the red wire coming out is, uh, you know, uh, applying the high potential between the current carrying conductors and the return is connected on the chassis of the product. So the potential is being applied between the current carrying conductors and the non-current carrying conductors. And the result reading is measured in um, ohms. Well, so the next test, the, the last test that we're going to talk about here is the line leakage test. I know we have not talked about this test uh, in some of our previous webinars. However, remember that we have um, dedicated webinars just on line leakage tests and medical device testing in which line leakage tests will be covered in a lot more detail. So be patient and uh, we will get to that uh, during our 2015 series of webinars. But just to quickly go over what this test does and just to get a you know, good feel of you know, what the line leakage test is all about, basically the line leakage test is performed on electrical products to measure the leakage current which could flow through a person's body or a person while the product is operating. So here within lies the big difference between line leakage test and other test types that we have talked about. And the big difference is that the line leakage test is performed when the product is actually operating, whereas the ground bond test, the, uh, the high pot test, the insulation resistance test, the, the electrical circuit in those tests are not energized. So the product is not running or operating in normal condition. Its product is off. The only thing being tested in the previous tests are the grounding circuit of the product and the insulation of the product. However, during line leakage tests, the, the product is actually running, operating normally. What is used to simulate the impedance of a human body under different conditions depending on the application of the product is what we call the measuring device, or not not be basically the standards refer to this as the measuring device. This is basically a circuit that you know that's set up, uh, you know, according to the standards, different safety standards, and uh, it's the the measuring device circuit is set up in a way that it 
simulates the impedance of a human body under different conditions depending on the application. The line leakage test is run under both normal and single fault conditions, reverse polarity uh, on the input line power sometimes at 110 percent of the rated input. This means uh, in order to perform a line leakage test you need to have a you know a power source which will keep your product powered up when the leakage current measurements are being made and uh, uh, different uh, uh, fault conditions are being simulated on the input line power. Most commonly the line leakage test is performed on medical equipment however there are standards for other product types that do call out for some basic line leakage tests. So here's a typical circuit for a line leakage test. On the right side again, the product, the device under test, our DUT with the line cord that plugs into um, the line leakage tester, which is on the left side. And as you can see, um, there's different switches in there, S1, S2, S3, which basically are there built in into the line leakage tester to, uh, to simulate different possible fault conditions that can occur on the input power line such as again you know an open neutral condition, a reverse polarity condition, an open ground condition and uh, um, again the measuring device has to be uh, placed in the right path in order to make the current measurements. Here's an example of a measuring device circuit. So what happened, what, what's, uh, what's going on here is that the measuring device circuit is basically a combination of resistors and capacitors and you know these can vary from standard to standard however the one that we're looking at in this picture is the measuring device from uh, one of the uh, you know uh, big standards for medical electrical equipment the EN 60601-1 and uh, in, in this measuring device circuit you can see there's a couple of resistors, uh, uh, there, there's a capacitor shunted by a couple of resistors and uh, basically this is uh, stimulating the impedance of a human body. Before we go any further um, and discuss some of our features, uh, patented features such as arc detection or smart GFI, uh, we'd just like you to uh, participate in a, another short poll and tell us if you are aware of the, these uh, um, you know, features and if you are already utilizing them. So uh, we're going to take a quick pause here. Okay, Syed, we have a good sampling of the audience um, right now, and 13% uh, are using ARC detection. Um, only 4% are using Smart GFI. 10% um, are using both, and then we had 37% um, not using any of those those features, and then we had 35% um, that were not using the features and uh, um, were not aware of, of them. Okay, thanks a lot, Jim, for sharing the results. All right, so we have the results of our uh, second poll, which was regarding ARC detection and Smart GFI. And once again, thank you for taking uh, for participating in our in, this, in these polls. And uh, the results of these polls are 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 interesting because it seems like a lot of you are not aware of these features, what these features are meant for, and some of you are actually using these features, some of you are not. So 
again, we're going to try and uh, you know look at these features and try and understand what these do and how these features can help you, um, you know, improve upon your testing. And um, hopefully, once we're done with this webinar, you will have a much better idea of what our detection is and what Smart GFI is. And hopefully, you will be able to better utilize these features. So, starting with ARG detection. Well, in order to understand ARG detection, it is first very important to understand what is what is ARCing. Well, ARCing is defined as a momentary partial discharge due to intense concentration of high voltage electric field across a dielectric. Well, now again, one one important thing to know about arc detection is that it is in in associated research uh, HIPAA testers. Arc detection is a feature that's that's included within the HIPAA test test itself, meaning that it's not a separate test on its own. It's a test within a test, and uh, how it works is what we're gonna talk about next. So many times, you know. Uh, Arcing conditions can, you know, be seen as a luminous discharge uh, caused by the ionization of air molecules, and um, which are actually called the corona. So high impedance arcing is a temporary condition, meaning that it's it's not a, a continuous condition, and it's not necessarily consi uh, considered a sign of high pod failure or a dielectric breakdown, meaning that arc detection is a totally different uh, animal. It does not tell you if, if you are using arc detection and if you get arc failures, that does not mean that your insulation has failed or it's a, or it's, it's a breakdown. Well, the, the condition that the high pod test is designed to test is basically breakdown. However, our detection is not that condition. The dielectric breakdown actually causes a massive amount of leakage current to flow through a product's insulation, while the arcing usually produces a momentary spike in the nominal leakage current waveform. So the arc detection circuitry was implemented to differentiate between these two conditions, meaning breakdown and arc detection. So here is a quick picture um, showing uh, the uh, arcing going on and the high frequency arcs riding on the low frequency uh, waveforms. So how is arc detected? Well, as we know, high impedance arcs and corona generate high frequency pulses that ride on the low frequency um, you know, test uh, uh, wave of the applied test uh, current waveform. Now, these pulses may have a frequency ranging from less than 30 kilohertz to more than one megahertz, and they may be very short in duration. Many times, these pulses are, you know, uh, much less than they last much less than 10 milliseconds, 10 microseconds. So that's a very very small period. And that's why it's called a momentary discharge. So, how does associated research arc detection circuitry work? How is arc actually detected? Well, um, so arc detection circuitry of uh, you know most of associated research products consists of a high pass filter uh, circuit that basically responds to frequencies greater than 10 kilohertz. These frequencies are then fed into a comparator and checked against the operator and operator programmed sensitivity level. And basically, the comparator compares the arc detection, the arcing levels versus the uh, sensitivity level that the user has set. And um, during the during the test setup. If this level is exceeded, an interrupt signal is fed into the CPU, which shuts down the high pod. Basically, so 
If an arc, arc failure occurs, the HIPAA test will be shut down. The arc detection failure displayed by uh, associated research HIPAA testers is separate from the high limit failure or breakdown failure, you know, which, uh, which occurs when, the, when there's actually a dielectric breakdown. So once again, the arc detection is, you know, a, is a test within the HIPAA test, but it does not indicate HIPAA failure or insulation breakdown. So why, why is arc detection important? Um, well, arc, arcing basically causes momentary high frequency current spikes that ride on the low frequency current waveform. Um, Although these current spikes may not be the result uh, of a catastrophic breakdown of the device's insulation, they could indicate a problem with the insulation system that might become a safety issue in the future or at a later date. This means that arc detection uh, or you know, including arc detection in your HIPAA test may give you some good information about or some extra information and it may give you a you know um, a value to, to determine or to predict how good the insulation of your product is gonna gonna be in the future. Um, now then that gives rise to the question when should arc detection be used? Well from a quality standpoint the more information is always useful in determining the product safety. So you know at times, several products have been damaged during shipping, resulting in poor gap spacing between a conductor and the insulation. Now, this condition may not be detected, uh, um, you know, by um, uh, by a HIPAA test because it may not result in a dielectric breakdown. However, if arc detection is used, it can it is possible to catch this this type of problem before the faulty products find their way um, out in the market into the hands of the customers. So again, our detection is an added feature that uh, we have included in our uh, that, in associated research iPod testers. And it's uh, basically depends on, um, you know, on the manufacturer or the standard uh, if you are required to, you know, check for arc detection or not. Um, but due to the nature of arc detection and the variables uh, uh, related uh, affecting the, the uh, you know, the detection circuitry, um, it is uh, basically, it gets a little puzzling and uh, even more puzzling that no specific, you know, arcing standard defines whether or not arcing is acceptable in electrical products and if so, to what degree. So basically, if you go by the standard, you may not find, most likely you will not find anything related to arc detection in the standard. So it basically comes down to the manufacturer to determine whether or not to use the arc detection and if so, at what level of sensitivity. And uh, the other important thing to know about arc detection is that with so many variables, arc detection becomes more of an approximation than a science. So it's, this is not an exact measurement and it is affected by various different factors. And um, again, we're going to talk uh, more about arc detection in uh, I think one uh, some of our upcoming webinars. But um, next thing I would really like to cover real quick is the smart GFI feature, which is basically the it's a patent feature in uh, all of electrical, uh, all of the associated research high voltage safety testers. And uh, the smart GFI feature is uh, it's uh, similar to you know the 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 GFI, the ground fault uh, circuit interrupt, the GFCIs in your household uh, electrical systems. So many testing apply uh, applications are very versatile, and uh, you know production lines can quickly be reconfigured to manufacture and test a wide range of products. In some cases, these products um, might be grounded via a production roller 
platform requiring the return of the electrical safety tester to be grounded. And on others, the return may be floating. So the smart GFI, the reason why it's called the smart GFI is because it ultimately provides uh, the most effective safety protection since it is an active circuit monitoring the configuration of the return connection of and also automatically sets itself accordingly. That's why we call it the smart GFI. It, you know, by eliminating the operator from the equation, the smart GFI basically works as an effective safety circuit because it does not require human interaction that could invite operator error. So, the smart GFI circuit, how does it work? Well, it basically detects any leakage flowing to ground during a high pod test or, or, or line, or, you know, a functional run test or a line leakage test. It, it detects the current uh, flowing between the return and the ground. And if it monitors, uh, you know, a certain level of current being flown uh, into the ground, it will uh, come up with a smart GFI failure. It is a high-speed shutdown circuit which disables the voltage in less than one millisecond. So basically smart GFI is a safety feature in the sense that if during a high pod test, for example, the operator comes in touch, uh, you know, or ends up touching the product under test, the device under test, the smart GFI is smart enough to detect that there is some current, um, you know, there's a deficiency of current coming back onto the return circuit. Therefore, it needs to shut down the output very quickly to protect the operator. Here's a quick, uh, uh, you know, picture of uh, showing uh, how the smart GFI works. And basically, you can see the operator on the right uh, is uh, touching the high voltage on the on the device under test and is at is, to, is at ground potential, and uh, GFI circuit is detecting any current that's leaking to ground instead of flowing back to the return circuit. And if such a condition occurs, the ground, uh, the smart GFI will kick in and shut down the high voltage or the output of the tester in less than a millisecond, uh, hence saving uh, the operator or whoever was in touch with the product. So once again, Arc detection and smart GFI are, are um, additional features that uh, Associated Research has uh, included in most of uh, their electrical safety testers. And uh, hopefully, after um, you know learning a little bit more about these features, you will be able to better utilize them. And if you haven't used them, you will be able to use them and see uh, if it makes a uh, difference in your testing and if it you know adds to the safety of your testing and gives you, uh, if, if you're talking about arc detection, it gives you more information about the product's uh, insulation. So at this point, um, we're basically done covering uh, the material that I wanted to cover in today's webinar. And I'm going to leave uh, uh, the webinar open for any last minute questions that you may have. Um, also, feel free to post any questions on the chat line or email us with your questions, um, uh, and we will definitely be able to answer those for you. So we're going to leave this open for another few minutes. Okay, um, while we're waiting for any questions, I just want to um, thank you all for being with us, joining us today for our very important webinar, and I think uh, we covered some very important topics today, and um, hopefully you will be joining us on our, for our next webinar, which is HiPod Testing 101. Basically, now we're getting to the part where we're going to be touching upon each of the test type.
uh, that that we have covered. So we're going to have a webinar. Uh, we're actually uh, having two webinars, dedicated webinars for HyPod tests because there's a lot we can talk about. HyPod tests, different features, diff uh, you know, parameters, different applications, uh, uh, different failure, understanding different failures for a HyPod test. So that's what we're going to cover in our next uh, couple of webinars. Once again, feel free to come up with any questions. We're still here uh, for a few more minutes. Syed, we are getting um, quite a bit of questions, so we're going to try to um, address them currently. Um, one of the questions uh, that, that's probably a real simple uh, answer for you is, is Smart GFI automatically activated uh, by default? Sure. So the question is, uh, one of the questions came up is that is the Smart GFI automatically activated or is it on by default? Well, it is, it is uh, if you purchase an, a HyPi tester, it is on by default, but since it's an active circuit, it basically detects if, you're, if the return circuit, of your, if, the, if, the pro, if the product that you're testing, if it's grounded or not, and it will activate accordingly. And uh, there are options uh, you know, in the user menu to go in and uh, deactivate the smart GFI. Also, in some of our models, the smart GFI circuit has a user, um, you know, uh, 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 basically the user can set the sensitivity level of the smart GFI, just like uh, they can, they can for the arc detection circuit, you can actually specify uh, a current level at which you want your smart GFI circuit to trip. Okay, thanks, Fred. I think we got time for um, a couple more. This is a common one that I that I know we get a lot. Um, sure. So I'll just throw it out there. What is the uh, acceptance criteria for leakage currents? I know, and then he provides further information. I know it depends on the DUT, but is there a standard that gives us a reference of this? Sure. So the question came up that. Um, is there an accepted level for leakage currents? Well, it depends if you're talking about high pot leakage. Uh, yes, some standards do specify um, acceptable levels of leakage. Again, that really depends on the product, the type of product you're testing. As a manufacturer, you should know what type of leakage uh, your product is going to exhibit during a line, during a you know a high pot test. And if you're talking about leakage currents uh, for a line leakage test, then yes, those are specified by the standard. The standard will actually give you a value of the leakage current, of the acceptable levels of leakage current. And based on those, you can set your um, uh, threshold, failure thresholds. Okay, um, at this time, um, it looks like uh, we're, we're almost done here um, with questions. And again, you know, if you have any other questions, you have all our information, um, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, just a few quick things. You can visit our website for more training resources, um, asresearch.com. And if you would like a copy of the presentation, contact Jim Kennessy at asresearch.com. Um, you can also follow us on uh, social media such as YouTube, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Um, uh, lots of good information on our website, uh, training materials, white papers, uh, um, you know, and a lot of other help. And plus, I'm also there, and our applications team is also there to help you with any questions that you may have on your application or the product that you're testing. So once again, um, it was a pleasure having you uh, join us and uh, you guys have a great day and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. 
This is your presenter, Sayed Abidi, signing off.